Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. My name is Janvier Zubrzycki. I'm professor of sociology and director of the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia here at the University of Michigan. And I have the pleasure and the honor to welcome uh, you to a very special event, a conversation with the president of Latvia, Egils Levitz, on Latvia, Europe, and the road ahead. Uh, moderating with me this conversation today is Daniel Alberstam, who is the Eric Stein Collegiate Professor of Law at the University of Michigan. Egis Levitz assumed the presidency of Latvia in July 2019 after a long and distinguished career. He studied law and political science in Germany, where his family found refuge after being expelled from Latvia in 1972. And he became a key participant in the, con in the country's restoration, authoring and conceptualizing the country's Declaration of Independence in 1990. He served as Vice Prime Minister and Minister for Justice in Latvia. He was Latvia's ambassador to Hungary, Austria, and Switzerland. And he was the first Latvian judge at the European Court of Human Rights. He was also judge of the European Court of Justice from 2004 until 2019. And he visited the U of M Law School then in 2017. So, Mr. Uh, President, welcome back to Ann Arbor. It's a great honor for us to have you uh, with us today. We're also honored uh, to welcome members of the visiting Latvian delegation. The First Lady of Latvia, Dr. Andra Levite. The Ambassador of Latvia to the United States, Mr. Maris Selga. Welcome. And the Honorary Consul of Latvia to Michigan, Mr. Andris Latsis. Welcome. We're also pleased to have, um, I think she's here, uh, the ambassador Susan Page with us. Is she Susan? No? Well, she, she might be joining us in a few minutes. Uh, she's a, from the Ford School Weiser Diplomacy Center, as well as the Honorable Eileen Weiser, whose generosity and dedication to our centers has made this event possible. Welcome, Ms. Weiser. Finally, uh, a warm welcome to the Michigan Latvian community. Uh, we welcome all of those uh, joining us virtually from Kalamazoo, Detroit, Grand Rapids, and other cities across the state. And um, you should see a button uh, at, the, uh, at the bottom of your screen uh, for Q&A. Uh, we won't be able to read those questions or comments, but we will print them and give them to Mr. President after the event. So please don't hesitate to share your comments uh, that way. Mr. President, um, let me open this conversation by asking you about the beginning of the current Republic of Latvia in which you were uh, a key player in establishing. Um, Latvia's declaration of restoration of independence in 1990 was carefully articulated around the illegality of the Soviet invasion of Latvia in 1940 uh, and the forcible annexation of Latvia uh, into the USSR in 1944. It took a little over a year after that uh, declaration for Latvia to obtain its full independence in August 1991. And that was four months before the collapse of the Soviet Union, which is important to mention. Latvia has been a stable democracy since. It has joined NATO and the EU in 2004. And so my question is, what role, if any, do you think that the peaceful transition articulated around legal principles and historical arguments uh, has played in setting Latvia into its course, um, Latvia and your Baltic neighbors, uh, onto that course. And I'm thinking, of course, of your other neighbors, like Ukraine and Belarus, who haven't been uh, successful in that way. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to thank the University of Michigan and uh, you, Professor uh, Halberstam, and uh, you, Professor uh, Zabrzycki, uh, for uh, this uh, meeting and organizing of uh, this event. Uh, I remember uh, very well our um, first uh, visit uh, four years ago. Uh, with the European Court of Justice, and you organized a very interesting discussion about uh, European law. 
And uh, so, uh, University of Michigan, we have also, uh, you asked me about the restoration of the independence, mm -hmm. but I would uh, like to mention also the establishing of the Latvian state uh, in um, uh, 1918. Mm -hmm. And uh, next year, we will celebrate the 100 years anniversary of uh, uh, the establishing of uh, diplomatic relations between the United States and Latvia. And uh, the first ambassador of uh, US to Latvia, Frederick Coleman, was born in Detroit and has obtained his law degree here by you at the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. So that right. at least University in Michigan and uh, Latvia has already 100 years uh, history of relations but concerning the restoration of, uh, of uh, the independence. It's uh, one of the um, rare cases that an uh, independent state uh, survives occupation mm -hmm. and then the independence is restored. Uh, but it is not unique. Mm -hmm. uh, during the Second World War, uh, German, Germany occupied, for example, Netherlands, Belgium, uh, Luxembourg, Denmark, Norway, Yugoslavia, and other, Poland. Poland. Uh, yeah, Poland, a part of Poland, the biggest part, and so on. And uh, uh, these states were restored 1944 or 1945, also for a short time after the occupation, four or five or six years, for example, in case of Austria, in case of uh, Czechoslovakia. By Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, it lasted longer, 50 years. Not mm -hmm. five years, but 50 years. But anyway, uh, the situation was analogous. After an illegal occupation, a restoration of the statehood, a restoration of the independence. And um, uh, the Baltic states, the uh, Baltic independence and democr uh, democracy movements were very, um, um, important not only in respect and regard to the restoration of independence, but also uh, in the changing of the European political map. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we should remember that the Baltic independent movements were, after, after uh, Gorbachev uh, started his uh, slow reforms, were always uh, organized forces, political forces, which demanded more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And during the four or five years of Gorbachev reforms, uh, Moscow was always in a defense position. They should, and then uh, they give more and more, gave more and more um, freedoms. And at the end, uh, we restored the independence. And after that, after that, uh, Soviet Union break down. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is uh, false to say that uh, we restored the independence uh, as a result of the breakup mm -hmm. of the Soviet Union. Uh, so <coughs> Soviet Union broke up mm -hmm. as a result of the independent movements of uh, Estonia, Latvia, and mm -hmm. Lithuania. And it was also a challenge for the other bloc uh, states, uh, Poland uh, under communist regime and Czechoslovakia and on, also to encourage uh, uh, the independent, uh, uh, the democratic movements. And the Berlin Wall uh, was uh, followed the so-called Baltic Way, the chain of two million people, which was mm -hmm. very important event at the day, a political uh, event, and this encouraged also Eastern Germany to, or the Eastern German opposition, uh, more precisely, to uh, go forward uh, with the reforms. So I think uh, the Baltic independent movements were important, of course, for us to restore, this was the first goal, of course, to restore democracy and independence, but the repercussions were, uh, so to say, immense also for Europe and also for the world. Also, that uh, leads also to the end of the Cold War. 
Thank you. I want to stay on, I mean, that's very important to see because people always think that it starts basically with the fall of the Berlin Wall and uh, Poles are very annoyed at that because they argue that it starts with the round table yeah. of, of uh, June and the first elections. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting, it's important to know that other countries in the region were very important in actually breaking away from communism and, and making that move toward uh, democracy in their own ways that contributed to that big transition of 1989 and then 1992. So thank you for, for uh, bringing some precisions on this. Um, another question I have is um, actually is related to the current situation in the region. Um, and since Latvia share borders with Lithuania and Estonia, of course, but also with Russia and Belarus, um, given that Russia thrives on destabilizing its neighbors and not only its neighbors. Um, how concerned are you by the situation in Belarus? Um, I have in mind here not only the autocratic regime's uh, uh, repression of democratic movements and uh, several dissidents seeking refuge in the Baltic states and in Poland, but also the situation uh, at the border with migrants and, and refugees uh, that's putting pressure on um, better Russian neighbors. Yes, um, yes uh, Latvia is um, um, very uh, worried about the situation in, in Belarus, it's a neighboring country, and uh, we see that uh, there was a, a falsification of the presidential elections, mm -hmm. and uh, the Belarusian people does not uh, want this to accept. Mm -hmm. And this is a reason of the situation in, in Belarus. Uh, it was an uh, absolutely unusual uh, situation that during many months there was a lot of demonstrations against the regime. But of course the regime has uh, all um, uh, repressive uh, apparatus, police and, and secret service and so on. So uh, I uh, think uh, that the regime is absolutely discredited in the eyes of the uh, Belarusian society. It is only uh, at the power uh, because of police secret service. And uh, this cannot last uh, for, for a very, very long time. So uh, I think that uh, it is, the situation is um, comparable um, with uh, situations in other parts of the world where there is a genuine, and this is very important to say, a genuine democratic movement uh, which wants to change the uh, uh, autocratic regimes. Mm -hmm. it, we have this in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, and also before uh, it was also in, in eastern part of Europe, uh, 89, 89, and the situation is also similar, uh, similar there. Uh, but I would also stress that this is a genuine movement. Mm -hmm. It is not from outside, exported mm -hmm. to Belarus. And uh, we can see that in Afghanistan, maybe it's much more difficult to organize, to, to establish um, a, a democracy uh, where the, I would say, historical, uh, traditional, cultural preconditions are not there. But this is no case, not mm -hmm. the case in, in Belarus. Yes. So uh, our position is that we are politically supporting uh, the demand for new, free, and fair elections. Also, we are supporting uh, the demands of the opposition. Uh, a few days ago, I had a speech at the Euro uh, United Nations General Assembly. I said that clearly also, uh, that the world community should uh, also politically uh, uh, support uh, the demands, uh, just demands of the democratic opposition. And the pressures at the border? Yeah, this is a response uh, of the Lukashenko regime to, uh, to uh, Europe, because um, we are members of the European uh, Union and NATO, and there are three borders, with Latvia, with Lithuania, with Poland. And uh, the Lukashenko regime is organizing, uh, so to say, uh, migrant flows. They are paying so more or less 10, 15,000 okay. euros for a flight. And uh, they're saying you can go freely to, 
to Europe, to Germany especially. And uh, so, but it's uh, our right and our duty to um, uh, to guard our uh, border because it's uh, outer border of NATO, it's outer border of uh, of uh, is, is the European uh, U Union, and it is also uh, supported and accepted by the European Union mm -hmm. because European Union is supporting us in this. Uh, in, in, in this position, because if we, uh, th this is a kind of, uh, um, we should not be the hostages of uh, the Lukashenko regime. Mm -hmm. So, and I think after a while, uh, Lukashenko re regime will see that uh, uh, this uh, instrument, the instrumentalizing of migrants as a weapon, I would say, mm -hmm is not successful and therefore uh, our position is uh, we are is common with Lithuania and Poland and uh, backed by the European Union. Thank you. Um, since we're talking about the European Union, I wanted to, to ask what you see uh, Latvia's role in the EU. I mean, Latvia is a small country. The Baltic states each are small together, however, they constituted a significant union, unit. So how, what do you see the contribution of Latvia and the Baltic states to the EU? Yes. Um, the size of Latvia is exact uh, the size of West Virginia. So 24,000 square, uh, square miles and approximately 2 million inhabitants. So you can see it's not Rhode Island, but it's already West Virginia. Uh, so, um, and uh, together with, uh, with Estonia and Lithuania, uh, we are three from 27 member states. And in the European Council, uh, each member state has a um, uh, vote. And uh, we are, uh, we, uh, our position in the European Union is uh, that we are, uh, Europe friendly. You know that in, in uh, some other member states there are 50-50, so more Europe, less Europe. It's not, not the case for Latvia, not the case for Estonia, for Lithuania. All uh, political parties which are represented in, in, uh, in the parliament are pro-European. Pro they have differences, they are leftist or rightist or, 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 or centrist, but European Union uh, or Europe is so to say, the common goal and uh, consensus. And uh, therefore, uh, we are contributing uh, to, to uh, the development of European Union uh, very constructively. We are working together in uh, a so-called format NB8 mm -hmm. also, that is Scandinavian members of the European Union and Baltic members, that's eight eight countries from already 27, one third. In, in, and in many important questions, we are uh, looking first to, uh, to, uh, to establish our common position so that we can put forward in the council. So uh, I think uh, we are for, uh, uh, for a development and deepening of the European uh, Union of uh, of the uh, common uh, market, uh, common interests. And also, we uh, are for a um, more visible European foreign policy, I would yeah. say. Uh, there are some, some questions how to, how to get this, how to organize a common policy which uh, can uh, which is in the interests and uh, uh, you know, of all um, European member states and uh, we how to get a consensus. Uh, in the most cases, I am speaking now in concerning foreign policy, in the most cases there is a principle of unanimity. Mm -hmm. And uh, in order to have more quick reactions, maybe uh, there is also a, um, uh, um, uh, discussion whether a majority would be enough, so to say that the majority can decide, could decide on the political, foreign political actions. I think uh, we should be carefully 
in this respect, um, so that uh, no country should be uh, has should have the feeling that uh, the interests of this country are not considered by the common foreign policy. And therefore, my proposal is uh, so-called no harm principle. So to say, if you, in principle, you can say no, and then the action is stopped. But you should not say no, uh, so, because maybe you have a deal uh, in, in another case. You should, uh, you should bring forward a strong motivation why and why it would be harmful, such a decision which is discussed for the respective country. It is something between unanimity and uh, majority. And I think uh, I will put forward also this uh, principle or this idea of this principle in, in uh, European institutions. Uh, I think it would be then it, we would have a more effective uh, European foreign policy. But uh, we have already effective, but we can have a more effective European foreign policy. Oh, so uh, th thanks so much, and, and wel welcome again, uh, Mr. President. Um, so uh, just to pick up on the, on the foreign policy point, I was wondering uh, what your views were, I, I guess, on the uh, current Biden administration's uh, various uh, moves. You might say there could be some, quite some disappointment among Europeans. Uh, back when Brexit was happening, uh, Trump was saying, well, if the UK leaves Europe, they're going to get in the back of the line. I'm going to talk to them last and kind of pushing. And Obama was sort of uh, you know, on the sidelines uh, saying the opposite. Um, and also when Trump was not consulting, Obama and Biden would say, we're going to do uh, consultations with everybody. And now you kind of have, one could say, I will say it, I'm not a diplomat, a double betrayal by the Biden administration. Um, not only are they uh, now not consulting on Afghanistan and on, on, on the Australian uh, submarine agreement, uh, but they're also uh, meeting with uh, Boris Johnson in the White House immediately. Um, and, and so in some sense, it does not quite seem as though either uh, the UK has to get at the back of the line, nor does it seem they're consult consulting particularly with Europe. So how does that make you feel, or how does that make the European yeah. Union feel? Yes, uh, I think uh, Biden administration uh, is uh, serious about uh, about um, uh, the necessity to have uh, strong allies in Europe. Uh, maybe it is it was not so visible uh, in the previous four years, but uh, now it is clear. And uh, for example, in the speech of President Biden a few days ago in New York and by United Nations General Assembly. He repeated many, many times that the uh, U.S. is together with allies. So, and I think this is a general idea, general principle of the uh, Biden administration in the foreign policy. And then, of course, uh, and this is uh, di different from the previous administration. And I think this is uh, very good for and uh, important for both, for Europe and for U.S. Because uh, the situation, the global situation in, in, in the world has changed. And we should reflect this change. And now uh, China uh, becomes a global power. I don't know whether this year or next year, uh, China would be also economically number one for, before, uh, for the United States in the economy. And uh, this is... Uh, this is a reality, and the United States should uh, also is, is seeing that, and also Europe. But the uh, United States, or North America, including Canada, I would say, and, uh, uh, and um, Europe, are based on the same democratic values. And this is very important. When we have several few um, centers of power in the world, then, of course, uh, the centers of power in Europe and, and uh, North America is building one big player or one big system, I would say, Western system. This is, these are Western values. And therefore, we should work together in order to uh, defend the threats for our fundamental beliefs, uh, for, for democracy, for rule of law. And uh, we, the situation is different as 10, 20 years ago. 
uh, our values are endangered in many ways we can speak about, but uh, it is, I think, Europe sees it, US sees it. And then there are, so to say, daily politics, uh, daily deals, and sometimes they are maybe not so, um, there could be disagreements, uh, but disagreements under France happens uh, toujours, uh, happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it, it, it's normal. Uh, so, and of course, this, uh, I can fully understand um, the disappointment of France, of President Macron, uh, but I see already that uh, they will uh, talk with, uh, with, uh, with each other in order to to clarify the situation. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Um, so from the, from the international to the domestic, and they're, and they're always connected, actually. I'm glad, actually, that you brought us back to 1918 in, in your original answer, because when Latvia restored its independence, um, uh, it did this by a legal move of mm -hmm. reestablishing re uh, the state as it existed in 1918. And one of the consequences of Latvia doing that was to grant citizenship to everybody who, at that time in 1918, mm -hmm was a Latvian citizen. And that had the result of uh, disenfranchising um, 300,000, I believe at the time, uh, people of Russian uh, descent uh, who had immigrated to Latvia in the intervening period. And to this day, there are still 200,000 such people in Latvia, and they are actually from an international or from, a, from an outsider's perspective, stateless. I realize your Supreme Court had said they're not technically stateless because they have a different non-citizen status. Uh, but it is sort of an unusual situation. I was wondering um, uh, how, how much progress has been made on that and, and how you view that, especially given the international challenges, again, also that you're dealing with, with Russia, who ha has a particular interest in this, and that, that must be quite complicated. Uh, the uh, restoration of independence, it was a full restoration of independence, uh, including the citizenship. We had Latvian citizens, for example, abroad in Europe, in the US, uh, despite the occupation. And I can, can remember again the situation in Western Europe during the Second World War. For example, Belgium was occupied, but uh, the Belgium uh, citizenship continues. And after the end of the Belgian occupation, then of course the citizenship became effective and absolutely the same. It is a consequence, uh, this is a consequence of the restoration, not new establishment no, no, of, of the state. Uh, but uh, uh, the uh, Soviet Union forced also the immigration in the Baltic states in order to have, uh, uh, so to say, the social basis for the occupation. Uh, so, uh, but uh, the people who uh, immigrated during uh, the Soviet occupation without consent of the legitimate uh, Latvian uh, government, uh, they have the possibility easily to obtain Latvian citizenship because it's necessary only to uh, live five years in Latvia and all of them, they're already 30 years, so that they're living uh, this uh, more than five years in Latvia and also to have some knowledge of the Latvian state language. And uh, if you are rising uh, up in, in or living in a country, of course, uh, in order to be uh, so to say, full citizen, you should know what the society or what the country is, 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 is saying, what their, their discourses and so on. And um, uh, the most young people have already Latvian citizenship. They want to be integrated. Some uh, older people don't want or they are hesitating because they are still hanging on the Soviet idea of Soviet imperium and uh, they are not regarding Latvia as a uh, legitimate state because uh, Soviet Union should be restored and so on. But uh, this uh, generation is, uh, is, uh, so to say, is uh, diminishing by in a <laughs> natural, natural way. But uh, if a person decides, for example, today to obtain Latvian citizen citizenship, it is completely possible. We are not compelling them. Uh, Yes, they have dual citizenship. It is uh, 
It is uh, uh, after the citizenship law uh, reform 2013. Uh, with uh, with um, uh, a number of countries, so to say, it's possible to have, including uh, U.S. It is possible from Latvian side to have double U.S. and Latvian citizenship, and many Latvians, members of the Latvian community, have this citizen, uh, both citizenships. Thank you. I think you wanted to take uh, questions from the audience. I maybe? think we're at the moment. Uh, I have lots more, but. So let's, let's open it up. Um, we have people with microphones. I would prefer, if you don't mind, if there are students in the audience who have a question, I would go first to the students. Anyone, any taker? Yes, no? So we have a gentleman here. If you don't mind, I will ask you if you can uh, maybe say your name and be very concise in your question so that we can. Oh, you got it. Thank you. Uh, my name is Karl Zirove. Uh, I'm a retired uh, full colonel from the United States Air Force. I lived in Latvia during the 90s, served uh, as a national security advisor to your friend, Maris Gail, and later on as the chairman of the Defense and Internal Affairs Committee in the SIMA. I have a two-part question. One is, regards the military, why don't uh, Latvian institutes something similar to what we know here as the GI Bill? Uh, it's uh, actually, the name of that is the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944. We currently have in Latvia an all-volunteer force, and I think it would uh, go a long way to improving the kind of uh, uh, people actually want to get in the service and by the same token, helping these people get a better education. The second part of my question is really right down your alley. Uh, regards uh, the, the court system of Latvia. Um, I think it's no secret to anyone that probably the court system of Latvia is probably one of the weakest institutions. And, uh, and, and as you well know, the idea of, of the court is to render a judgment quickly and justly, okay? Um, we currently have a, one instance where a gentleman was finally convicted after seven years, and that process is not complete yet. Another case earlier of several years was where we, uh, where a gentleman was convicted in Latvia, went to European Union, and was, and Latvia had to pay him compensation. I would like to know from you uh, what specifically uh, you have instituted or changed to any of the, the laws that govern Latvia's judicial system, and what is your prospect for doing so for the remainder of your, your uh, time in office? Yes, uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, so, uh, first question concerning uh, the specific law on uh, on uh, military service, we have such laws, including also the social uh, social um, uh, side, is uh, also provided for 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 the man and the woman uh, who are serving in in in, in Latvian army. Uh, so uh, there are dif different uh, different social uh, social benefits for them. Uh, also, uh, promo uh, promotion of education, of professional education. So it's during your service you can obtain a specific uh, profession and so on. Concerning the second question, I, I think uh, this, uh, you are um, saying that uh, the courts are uh, the weakest institutions, uh, are uh, not, uh, not more true. It was in the 90s when you were in Latvia. Uh, Latvian uh, court system is uh, developed, is uh, strong, I would say, and uh, what you mentioned, some, some very long uh, processes. Uh, there are absolute exceptions, and we can see one by one why such exceptions happened, but in general, uh, between the 27 member states of the European uh, Union, Latvia is in the best side, also for maybe on the 10th or 12th place concerning the speed of uh, judicial decisions, including the last decision, the last instance in the Supreme Court. 
So we are uh, in our our court proceedings uh, much more quicker as in uh, many uh, older European uh, member states. Uh, I will not mention the so, but big member states, I would say. Yeah. So, uh, yes, so this is the situation now, and uh, then we can look why for procedural reasons for some failures, there uh, are some procedures which uh, last longer, but, uh, but in general, it's, it's not the case. So, concerning what I will do, I, um, I uh, will uh, uh, introduce or uh, propose uh, together with the, uh, with the government uh, a, a technical change in, in the criminal procedure law, which provides uh, that uh, it is a specific term, provides now in, by law, for the judge to deliver judgment. It was not the case till now. It was, uh, so to say, by, by the workflow, it was organized by the judge himself, and now it should be a formal, uh, formal uh, term. Uh, I said, as you said, I, I served um, 15 years at the European uh, Court of Justice, and uh, there, this term was where uh, six weeks, and I think uh, it would be enough, six or eight weeks, but it uh, would, should be set by law. And this is answer to, to, to your question. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Is there another question from the audience? If you can stand up, please. Hi there. Um, oh. Okay. Oh, you first, and then we have, maybe we'll take uh, yours, then the second one together, and you can respond to both, and that will conclude the event. Um, I'm Nate. Um, I was wondering, as members, I guess more recently, of the larger communities of <coughs> NATO and the EU, how important is close relations and a unity of purpose to the security and stability of the Baltic states, um, close relations within each other, the three states, and how do you maintain those and strengthen them within the broader community? You mean uh, consultations? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, yes, we, we have a very uh, close consultation system with Estonia and uh, Lithuania. We are now consulting concerning the specific situation on the border with Belarus, also with Poland, because we have the same, uh, the same uh, Pro problem, yeah. And uh, just, uh, just uh, two days ago, uh, we had such consultations on the highest level with the Polish president, the Lithuanian president, but also Estonian president here in New York during the UN General Assembly. We are consulting, and uh, our politics concerning uh, the defense of our border, uh, we are, uh, we are uh, the same, uh, so that uh, we are firm also, and we, are con we have consultations also with NATO and uh, European Union, and European Union also is uh, backing this, uh, our politics. Okay, I have the honor. Uh, thank you for very interesting remarks. Two very short questions. One, do you think that Ukraine should be invited to join NATO? And two, what do you think NATO's role should be in the U.S. pivot to Asia? In U.S.? Uh, the U.S. pivot to Asia? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, concerning the first question, uh, Latvian poli poli uh, policy is to keep the doors open open door policy. And then, of course, it depends uh, from the situation when Ukraine should uh, join uh, NATO. And the same uh, concerns Georgia, for example. Uh, so, and this depends from political situation uh, in, in the region, also from, from the consent within the NATO member states. And uh, so, but in general, I would say that uh, one day Ukraine will be also a uh, member state of NATO. Um, concerning uh, the second uh, question, it was about uh, NATO's... Uh, US pivot, the US shifting to the... To Asia, to Asia. yeah. So, um, um, 
I can absolutely understand, and uh, Europe understands, that the uh, uh, United States has, I would say, a new, uh, not very new, but relatively new um, re arrival in, in uh, China in the Pacific uh, re region. And uh, rival not only for sort of economic uh, reasons, but also for political reasons, because China and U.S. have an absolutely different uh, political and uh, social order, and uh, based on different values. Then, and uh, uh, Europe uh, is, uh, um, so to say, ally of all sta states, European states, which are members of the NATO, allies of United States. And uh, as I said already, President Biden uh, stressed the, uh, by, by his speech a few days ago, stressed the importance of European allies for US. And indeed, it is so that um, only together, Europe and US can manage uh, the situation now, which is the international global situation now, in order to uh, to be strong and defend uh, our values and our interests, and I think this transatlantic link, despite some querels, uh, are very very important, and uh, this as a transatlantic link is the backbone of the defense or uh, the resilience, I would say, of uh, the state and also of the, uh, in both in the US and in Europe is, uh, so to say, common sense uh, uh, in, in US and in Europe. So, but uh, together with US, with, we should also develop our China policy. Yes, so I, I just had one, uh, one, one last question that uh, is about a subject that must keep you up at, at night, um, and I just wanted to give you an opportunity to comment. Um, it's been 20 long years now since Latvia has won the European uh, Vision Song Contest. Um, <laughs> when will Latvia win it next, and what will you do to help bring that about? Oh, in in meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, we had, also, uh, I think, also one last place, but <laughs> But uh, now it's uh, coming better and better. And I think this year, next year, and maybe in three years. <laughs> Latvia's back. Thank you. Yeah. Latvia is also back. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you, Mr. President, for taking the time to visit us in Ann Arbor. Uh, on behalf of the University of Michigan, the Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia, we thank you. And well, that's <laughs> Anytime again, I have an open invitation. Uh, I will like to um, ask everyone to remain seated until uh, Mr. President and his delegation have uh, had time to exit the Zoom. And I thank you everyone in the audience and those watching from home also, thank you for joining us today. So thank you. And uh, I, um, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, Professor Halberstam, Pro Professor Zabrzewicki, and uh, the Michigan uh, University of Michigan, all students, all participants uh, for uh, this event. I think um, it was uh, for me an occasion to explain Latvia's and uh, European views on, on different issues uh, of international uh, politics, which are interesting also for US. And uh, uh, thank you for, for your hospitality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.